for all those who appreciate the work that we're doing here on Standing for Truth, please hit that subscribe button because we are just getting started. Well, if I understand it right, what we're supposed to be discussing here, debating or uh, something is the question, is the flood story true? Is Noah's Ark story true? Is the Bible correct? Um, and thank you for doing this. And Adam, I was told your uh, MS is in zoology and herpetology, the study of reptiles and animals. Uh, true is something that's in accordance with fact or reality. Would it be a fact, would it be reality that the, f the world was completely flooded and one family built a boat and saved all the critters on the boat? That's what the story says in Genesis chapter 6, 7, and 8. So is it true? Uh, in accordance with actual state of affairs is the Webster Dictionary definition of the word true. Definition of true, something that is real, factually correct, accurate, or provable, as opposed to a lie. The Apostle uh, Pilate said in uh, John chapter 18, what is truth? And by the way, most politicians still have no clue what truth is. <laughs> Nothing's changed in 2,000 years. The Bible tells us to think about things that are true. And so I don't want to believe anything that's not true. And so if the flood story isn't true, I would sure like to know it. Uh, I'm very willing to, uh, to be taught on this. Let me give you a quick history of uh, where I think this all fits together. In the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, Peter warned us that in the last days there would be scoffers who would come, who would be willingly ignorant that of how by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. The Bible's pretty clear <clears throat> when God made the earth, it was standing out of the water and in the water. What does that mean? Well, then it says, the, the, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. This world was destroyed by a flood. That's what the book says. Now, is it true? Well, the Bible says God sits on the circle of the earth and he stretched out the heavens. There are 17 references in the Bible to the stretching of the heavens, which is, explains the red shift and all that. But I want to get up to the part about the flood. I think to understand about Noah's flood and about the ark story to find out, is this true? We first need to have an understanding of what the earth used to be like, according to the Bible. Just like when you study any historical event, like World War II, you know, why did the Germans attack England? Well, you need to know the background behind it. What happened? What was going on here? And so to know the background behind the ark story, you need to understand what was the earth like. It says uh, in the Bible, the earth was formed out of the water and in the water. I believe there used to be a seventh layer of our atmosphere. There are now six layers to the atmosphere, troposphere, stratosphere, exosphere, etc. The seventh layer was a layer of water or ice probably above the atmosphere, probably six miles up, or a numetric system that would be, what, uh, 100, uh, 10 kilometers straight up. Uh, at, there are some heat sinks up there. As you go up in the atmosphere, you get up a certain altitude, like 10 kilometers or six miles, and it's 100 below zero right now. Right now, over our head here in Alex, uh, Lenox, Alabama, where it's, what, 95 degrees out there. So the earth had a canopy of water overhead. It also had water under the crust of the earth. And I cover this on video number two of my seminar series. Let me get up here. Uh, but the Jews have always taught there was water above the atmosphere. Here we go. Right here. There was also water under the crust of the earth. <clears throat> Most of the flood water for Noah's flood did not come from rain. Most of it came from inside the crust of the earth. Um, got a globe here somewhere. I did have. Where'd it go? Oh, here we go. All right. Um, the earth today has a crust about 10 miles thick. Uh, it varies sometimes only three miles thick under the, con under the ocean beds. But this crust of the earth used to have water in the crust of the earth, according to the scriptures anyway. The Bible says in Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's. He founded it upon the seas. That means the foundation was upon the seas. And he established it upon the floods. So according to the Bible, the flood water was inside the earth, most of it. Same thing in Psalm 33. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depth in storehouses. The depth is always a reference to the sea or the ocean in the Bible. So it used to be stored up inside the earth. Of course, everybody that studies earth science knows there's still a lot of water in the earth. Um, huge amounts of water still in the crust of the earth, subterranean water pockets. Okay, Psalm 36, 136, he stretched out the earth above the waters. So the original creation had a layer of ice above, I'm just guessing 10 miles up, probably two or three inches thick. That made the earth like a big greenhouse, protected them, made them have perfect weather, perfect temperature, pole to pole, made the animals grow huge. 
gigantic animals are found as fossils that simply are not alive today. They find fossil grasshoppers two feet long, fossil centipedes 18 inches long, fossil uh, dragonflies with five foot wingspan. They simply could not fly today. Something had to be different. So a canopy overhead, like I think the Bible teaches, would, would be a, a reasonable explanation. They had greater air pressure and richer oxygen concentration to allow the insects to get much larger and probably all the animals to get much larger in that world before the flood came and all this got messed up. There was a layer of air to breathe, probably 10 or 15 miles, and then a layer of rocks to stand on, the crust of the earth. Again, pick a number, 5 to 10 miles. And underneath that was water stored up for this flood. There, Walt Brown's book, the, In the Beginning, is fabulous on this, the hydroplate theory, how that there was water in the crust of the earth, and there still is a lot of it. The Bible says, in the 600th year of Noah's life, the same day were the fountains of the great deep broken up. Most of the flood water actually came from inside. It only rained for 40 days, but the water kept coming up for 150 days. So it's not all coming from rain. It's not possible to rain enough to cover all the mountains. I understand that. I don't think the mountains were there. I think the Bible teaches pretty clearly in Psalm 104, at the end of the flood, the mountains arose, the valley sank down, and the water rushed off to fill in the holes. So it's interesting that all the mountain ranges today follow the coastlines. The Appalachian Mountains here in America follow the North Atlantic. The Rocky Mountains follow the Pacific. I think the mountain ranges formed during the last few months of the flood when the mountains arose and the valley sank down and the water rushed off. The plates of the earth, the earth is broken up into plates. I don't think anybody argues about that. Those plates would be shifting and moving with the weight of all this water on top while the joints where they meet, the fault lines, was still weak, freshly broken and they could still move. So the fountains of the deep broke open, and then the windows of heaven were opened, and it rained for 40 days. But the water underneath is really where the flood came from. It came shooting out to the surface along the cracks. The earth cracked up like an eggshell, and we have fault lines, San Andreas Fault, the Hayward Fault, the New Madrid Fault. None of them are my fault, but the earth def definitely has cracks all over the place, and some are still <coughs> moving, and we still have volcanoes and earthquakes along those cracks generally. But... <clears throat> The water rushing out during the flood, rushing out of these cracks, would be under incredible pressure, 10 miles of rock. It would go shooting up like a rocket. Actually, a cubic foot of rock is about 160 pounds. That's what, uh, 70, 65, 70 uh, uh, kilograms. Uh, this would put 30 tons per square inch of pressure, 30 tons per square inch on the water underneath. It would go squirting out like a, what's the name of that water pressure thing they cut steel with? Uh, water jet. Water jet. They make a water jet that'll cut through solid steel. 30 tons per square inch would shoot rocks up into orbit. I think we are still hitting debris from the stuff that was launched off the earth 4,600 years ago during Noah's flood, 4,400 years ago. The other night we're out watching the shooting stars and zip, zip, they go across the sky. It, we're still hitting the debris that we let that we launched off of here. Is it scattered in space and we're traveling around the sun? And once in a while, we smack into it like bugs on a windshield. So some of the rocks would launch up from the flood and come back and land on the earth right away. Those would be erased by the flood. You would never see evidence of those. Those that landed near the end of the flood would probably leave a crater, but then most of it filled in, depending how long it was exposed to water. Like the one in Quebec, Canada, 40, what, 60... 46 miles across, I think it is, the biggest crater on Earth known. That probably formed during the last part of the flood with a few weeks to go, and most of it filled in. And now it's just a circular uh, lake. But the moon was probably shattered during this time, <coughs> splattered with stuff coming off the Earth. The craters on the near side of the moon, the crater pattern is very different than the craters on the far side. This would be the stuff that shot past, got drawn back in by moon's gravity, and hit it on the backside. Earth has a lot of impact craters on it. Uh, you can go. You got some in England, I think, uh, down near the southern, southeastern tip of England. What's that, Cornwallis? No, it's the other side. Anyway, you have craters over there. Here's a Behringer crater in Arizona. <clears throat> I think this would have to be hit after the flood because it didn't fill in with sediments. It's still a big hole in the ground. The flood water escaping from underneath would cause the continents to slide back. Just like today, if you put two blocks of rock on top of a spring, move the rocks apart, all of a sudden the spring will bounce up in the middle 
And the crust of the earth would do that. The, the subterranean work of the world, the basalt layers, would spring up into the crack. As the crack gets wider, probably from simple erosion, from the water gushing out, as it gets to a certain depth or width, all of a sudden the bottom springs up. This happens in large mines all the time. They keep digging out the rock. As they get further and further back, all of a sudden the bottom of the mine buckles up just from the weight on the outside. It might be a quarter mile away, but it makes the center of the mine buckle up. You can study all that. So I think Walt Brown is exactly right. The crust of the earth broke. The water came out. The basalt underneath lifted up, causing the crust of the earth to slide away. As long as there's still lubricating water under there, it would eventually grind to a halt when it hits bottom. That explains why we have wrinkled mountains. It's no different than pushing a carpeting up into the wall. All of a sudden, it begins to wrinkle up. So lateral movement of the crust of the earth would cause these wrinkled mountain patterns that we find around the world. Uh, the earth still has the uh, fault lines on it today. I think all the evidence from, that we see from earth science and from geology points to the fact this earth was destroyed by a flood. They find fossils on top of Mount Everest, tallest mountain in the world. Fet petrified clams in the closed position. I think I got one here. Yep. When you get petrified clams in the closed position, you know it had to be buried alive. There's a place in North Alabama where there are 10 feet thick, millions of petrified clams, beds of clams, closed. You can go down to the beach 70 miles south there in Pensacola and find a million seashells, but you aren't going to find a matched pair, and you certainly won't find them closed. Had to be buried alive. I don't know of another choice. If you've got a better theory, I'd like to see it. So here the Bible says, Noah built an ark, Save two of each kind on board. I'm not sure exactly what a kind is in every case, but two of each kind, probably about 4,000 kinds of animals, plus the birds, maybe another 1,000 kinds of birds, just guessing, had to be on that ark. Then after that, they have diversified now through natural selection and variation within the kind. They've diversified into millions of species, but that's different than kinds. So... Today, the Earth has uh, ocean basins. 70% of the Earth is still underwater. So if someone asks, where did the water from the flood go? It's still here. It's in the oceans. Just the Pacific is big enough to hold every continent in the world. All the continents would fit in just the Pacific. The Earth today is 71% underwater. Only 29% is above water. And the part that's above water is only an average height of 2,300 feet or 2,600 feet whereas the depth of the oceans averages 12,000 feet. So today, if you smoothed out the world, pushed, push all the mountains down, smooth it out, the water would be 8,000 miles deep, 8,000 feet deep, everywhere, a mile and a half of water, completely covering the earth. That water's still here. The oceans today are gaining salt as mineral salts wash off the ground uh, from, from water and erosion and rivers. And the evaporation takes out the water only, leaves the salt behind. It's a giant distillation process. So the oceans are gaining salt every day, yet they're only 3.6% salt. At the rate they're gaining salt, you would say, hey, this could have happened in a few thousand years. I think during Noah's flood, all the world was fresh water. Noah didn't have to bring water on board. He probably brought babies of all the animals, about six or 8,000 different kinds of animals. Onto the ark. He didn't have to bring insects because they don't have nostrils. So God told him to bring those in whose nostrils is the breath of life. And insects can survive a flood just fine. So the flood was probably all fresh water, had all the water they needed, and now it's gradually become saltier since the flood. And some animals have adult, ad adapted to salt water. We now have freshwater alligators and saltwater alligators, or crocodiles, I'm saying. They might have had a common ancestor called a crocodile. That's not true. Crocodiles are related to mosquitoes. So to change, there are saltwater bass and freshwater bass. One minute, One minute left. Okay. So today there is still an enormous amount of water in the crust of the earth. There are hot water subterranean vents. If there's hot water shooting up into the bottom of the ocean, where does it have to be coming from? Lower than the bottom of the ocean. Like, duh. Okay. Tens of millions of these hot water vents are shooting up down there. And there's plenty of evidence of there still being a lot of water in the crust of the earth. Deep sea hydrothermal vents, they're called, and you can Google that and get a million pictures. So my position is it is very reasonable, it is logical, it is true to believe there was a flood that destroyed this world. We have evidence of the damage it did all over the place. It is certainly reasonable that all the animals could come from seven or 8,000 pairs of animals on a boat. 
it is not reasonable that all the animals could come from a rock 4.6 billion years ago, like the evolution theory teaches. It is reasonable that all the peoples of the world could come from a family of eight on a boat. 